Ladies and gentlemen, good uh, good afternoon to you. Uh, my name is Robert Parkin. I'm joined today by Hank Sode, uh, both from Decker Chambers. Uh, we're going to be speaking to you today about uh, common litigation pitfalls. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on the rules regarding witness statements and in particular foreign language witness statements and also the rules which apply uh, specifically in the business and property courts. Um, Henk is going to be talking to you today about uh, the disclosure scheme in the business and property courts. So this seminar is going to be of particular interest to those of you who practice in, in that jurisdiction. Uh, Hank, can we have the first slide, please? All right, uh, so as I say, I'm going to be uh, going through the requirements for witness statements. Uh, the basics are in CPR 32.8. Uh, the requirement is that a witness statement complies with the requirements of practice direction 32. Uh, so there is a formal provision within the rules uh, that a witness statement must comply with certain technical specifications, uh, it, primarily in the practice direction to part 32. Uh, also, of course, in part 22 relating to statements of truth in particular, and we'll go through those uh, in turn. And finally, for those of us practicing in the business and property courts, uh, in and of themselves, uh, the practice direction to part 57, practice direction 57 AC contains additional requirements, uh, which I have to say I've always found rather rather peculiar in that they they, they really are um, only good practice requirements uh, which apply also uh, to, to uh, it, in a less formal sense, uh, to other types of witness statements. Uh, why does this matter? Hank, next slide, please. Uh, well, if you get it wrong, um, paragraph 25 of practice direction 32, uh, in a nutshell, a court can refuse to admit uh, a, a non-compliant witness statement, uh, and you can be required to make an application analogous to, but not the same as, an application for relief from sanctions, uh, CPR 25-2. It's the sort of mistake that's easy to avoid, but very expensive if you do it. Uh, very disappointing indeed to your client if they do it, and an area to be taken advantage of if an opponent in litigation does it. Okay, Hank, next slide, please. Um, let's have a look at how it works in practice. Uh, well, the first recent piece of case law from the um, from the High Court sounds like uh, it, it's a fairly light touch in this area. Uh, practice Direction 57 AC, so this is a business and property courts case, uh, involving copyright infringement. 57 AC uh, should not be taken as a weapon with which to fill it uh, from a witness statement, either two or three words at various points or, or, or essentially insignificant failures to comply uh, before an application is made to strike out passages in a witness statement. Careful consideration should be given as to proportionality. Uh, indeed, such an application is warranted only where there's a substantial breach. So uh, we, we, we can't uh, expect the courts to take a hammer to a witness statement where there are relatively minor breaches. But next slide, please. Um, be aware that the courts will uh, strike out whole witness statements or parts of witness statements in circumstances uh, where uh, there is uh, genuinely uh, large scale non-compliance. In this case, again, uh, a, a, a dispute over packages of land used as a zoo, uh, whether parts of uh, the witness statement in question complied with the practice direction 57, uh, 57 AC. Um, it, what, what was described there was uh, the, the, the non-compliance in the witness's statement was substantial and flagrant, uh, and there was a good chance on an application that the defendant, uh, whose witness statement it was, would have been refused permission to rely on that statement. Uh, so in that case, an order was made striking out, I forget if it was the whole or substantial parts of the witness statement, substantially to the defendant's detriment. Um, next slide, please. Even if you can get away without that, uh, third case McKinney and the Construction Industry Training Board. Um, what's the point here? Well, there the offending claimant's witness statement was admitted but on the pain of uh, an indemnity costs order. So even if you get away with it, you've got to assume that a mistake is going to be expensive. So let's look at first at, at what the requirements actually are. 
Next slide, please. Um, well, that, 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 next slide again, Hank. This is that's no more than a summary of what I've said. What are the requirements? I'm going to mark in bold text areas which I think are of particular importance, and they're going to focus on the language of the witness statement, uh, where you have a witness whose whose first language is is not English or, or Welsh in uh, Wales. Uh, paragraph 17 uh, to the practice direction of part 32 uh, it is the start of the requirements. A witness statement should be headed with the correct title of proceedings. Uh, that's set out uh, elsewhere in the in the rules. Uh, but more to the point, at the top right hand corner of the page uh, should be clearly written uh, the party on whose behalf it's made, the initial and surnames of the witness, identifying the number of the statement in relation to that witness, so identifying the initials and number of each exhibit referred to. So if you have your your uh, witnesses initials and then a number one to indicate it, uh, an exhibit, uh, that should be set out uh, at, in the top right hand corner. The date the statement is made, obviously enough, it will also need to be dated uh, in the statement of truth and the date of any translation. And it's the first of a very significant number uh, of references uh, to translation of a witness statement, which we'll come to in quite a bit of detail later. Probably not the most important requirements in and of themselves, but let's get it right. Next slide, next slide, please. Uh, part 18, again, a reference to uh, the witness statement being in the witness's own language. And this is, I, I'm going to suggest, probably the crucial provision that the courts are concentrating on at the moment. Uh, the witness statement must, if practicable, be in the intended witness's own words. Yes, fair enough, and must in any event be drafted in their own language. Uh, the statement should be expressed in the first person and should set out their name, uh, address, occupation, if any, um, the fact that he is a party to the proceedings or an employee of such a party, if that's relevant, uh, and the process through which the statement has been prepared. Now, that I think also is a potentially relevant uh, uh, question because the courts are increasingly concerned, it, it seems to me, with the manner in which witness statements are prepared. The suspicion always has been that um, lawyers are drafting witness statements and putting words in their clients' mouths. Um, so uh, trying to make sure that it's got that paragraph setting out how the witness statement is prepared. This was done in conference. Uh, this was done over the telephone. This was done by way of an exchange of emails with the client, whatever, uh, whatever it is. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the witness statement must indicate, this is all fairly trite law still, uh, which of the uh, statements are made are within the witness's own knowledge and which uh, are matters from information uh, or belief. Uh, so, so far as possible, the, uh, the, the statement should say, well, these are matters within my own knowledge, except by, with the exception of uh, material I've gleaned from reading such and such an archive or from perusing these emails, or I believe, but don't know that the following is, is true. It's more a good practice requirement than anything else. Um, 18.3 relates to the requirements for exhibits. 18.4 uh, through to 6 sets out how exhibits in which statements uh, should be managed. It's all uh, fairly uh, fundamental material there, I'm sure very familiar. Uh, next slide, please. Um, part 19. And I'm not going to insult anyone's intelligence by, by describing the kind of paper or the the the, the, the margin that, should, that the witness statement should be printed on. I, I've never seen that point taken in the court, and I don't suppose it would be. Uh, what is important is that, again, there's an emphasis at paragraph 19.8 on the witness statement being drafted uh, in the witness's own uh, language. Um, and we'll, again, we'll, we'll come to that in due course. Uh, do note there are requirements for numbered paragraphs, uh, dates uh, and numbers to be expressed in figures rather than words. Uh, as far as possible, uh, a witness statement should plead uh, 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 or should set out its case in a chronological order. That's our paragraph 19 too. Good stylistic points, but not, I think, themselves the most significant. What is significant is the language provision. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, paragraph uh, 22 of the practice direction, we're going to skip forward uh, a couple of paragraphs for reasons that, uh, that, that, that not, not, not the size piece, we're going to skip forward a couple of paragraphs in the practice direction for reasons that will become apparent as we, as we carry on through. 
superb alterations uh, to a witness statement can be done uh, with the court's permission, generally speaking. Uh, but where there are such uh, uh, changes, they should be initialed by the witness to indicate that the witness agrees with the contents of uh, that uh, witness statement. Um, I've never seen anyone rely on this paragraph, but in principle, you could. A witness statement which contains an alteration that has not been initialed may be used in evidence only with the permission of the court. So the, 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 the litigant or the party has to apply for relief, uh, at least orally. Uh, next slide, please. This is perhaps the area where it starts to become less trite and of more direct applicability uh, to those of us practicing in uh, the business and property courts. And it's it's the practice direction to part 57. And note that a lot of the case law that I took you through at the start of this presentation uh, concerns non-compliance with the content provisions of this uh, 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 practice direction. Uh, so uh, I think we can infer from that that where there is serious non-compliance, the courts will impose sanctions in relation uh, to the contents of, of witness statements. And there does seem to be an emphasis, particularly in the business and property courts, on compliance uh, with these particular provisions at the moment. That's over the last year or 18 months or thereabouts. Um, so I'm going to take you through what, what, what I think of as the particularly significant provisions. Uh, paragraph three, of the practice direction uh, to part 57. Uh, a trial witness statement must set out only matters of fact of which the witness has personal knowledge that are relevant to the case and must identify by, uh, by list what documents, if any, uh, the witness has been referred to or been referred to for the purposes of providing evidence uh, set out in the trial witness statement, the evidence set out in the trial witness statement. The requirement to identify documents the witness has referred to or been referred to does not affect the privilege that may exist in relation to any of those documents. So um, one can understand where why the rule is in this format uh, for the business and property courts in particular. Um, you're often dealing with large complicated cases uh, involving companies with multiple employees having access to multiple pieces of information. The temptation to simply consolidate all of that into a witness statement, not really within the direct knowledge of a, a lead witness, uh, but simply for convenience. Uh, it is a real one. It's, it's one I'm sure we're all familiar with. That's not the right way to do it. Uh, the right way to do it is simply to set out what material the witness actually knows. And if the witness is taking evidence from, as I say, for example, a company archive, um, a company's records, its accounts, whatever it is, the witness sets out what those documents are by way of list um, and describes the information that they've taken from that, from those records or as may be. And that can be the case even if that underlying document is privileged. And the disclosure of the fact that the witness statement, or the beg your pardon, the maker of the witness statement uh, has had sight of material which is privileged does not affect the underlying privilege. So it's a uh, one can anticipate a degree of tactical complexity there. And then paragraph 3.3, uh, it, it's a reminder that the witness statement must uh, comply with practice direction 32, paragraphs 18.1 and 18.2 in particular. Well, recall both of those concern the language of the witness statement. Uh, and if there was any doubt that that's where this provision is going, it, 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 it repeats it. And for that purpose, a witness's own language includes any language in which the witness is sufficiently fluent to give oral evidence, including under cross-examination if required, and is not limited to a witness's first uh, or native language. That's good practice. We'll be looking specifically at the question of, a lang of the language of a witness statement uh, in due course. Um, uh, but that I suggest is uh, well, it's it's a formal requirement in the business and property courts, and it's a good practice way of looking at uh, at this issue if you're dealing uh, with uh, material which is not in the business and property courts uh, system. Uh, trial witness statements should be prepared in accordance with the statement of best practice contained in the appendix uh, to this 
practice direction. Uh, bear in mind that that exists. I'm, it, 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 it's a level of detail which is which is beyond the, the, the scope of this seminar, but there exists in the appendix to the practice direction to part 57, uh, a statement of best practice in relation to witness statements. And if you're drafting a witness statement in the business and property courts, uh, generally, it's going to be a very good idea to familiarize, familiarize yourself with the statement of best practice. Okay, hang, next slide, please. Okay, paragraph four, a trial witness statement must be verified by a statement of truth as required under CPR 22. Again, we'll, we'll come back to those in a moment. And paragraph 22, 20.2 rather, of the practice direction to part 32. Again, come back to that in a moment, unless the court orders otherwise. Don't think I've ever seen a court order otherwise, or, or indeed that be sought. I can't really imagine the circumstances in which it would. Uh, but there we have it. Court can order otherwise. Um, and it, in the business and property courts, that statement of truth m must also contain the following confirmation. Um, I, I understand that the purpose of this witness statement is to set out matters of fact of which I have a personal knowledge, while well, that echoes paragraph three. Uh, I understand it's not my function to argue the case either generally or on particular points or to take the court through documents in the case. Again, that echoes part uh, paragraph three rather. This witness statement sets out only my personal knowledge and recollection uh, in my own words uh, on points that I understand to be important to the case. I have stated honestly, A, how well I recall matters, and B, whether my memory has been refreshed, refreshed by considering documents, and if so, how and when. Uh, I have not been asked or encouraged by anyone to include in the statement anything which is not my own account to the best of my ability and recollection of events which I witness or matters of which I have personal knowledge. So it's a much more elaborate statement of truth um that, that that is going to be the area that i will say is of secondary greatest importance after only uh, the question of the language of the witness statements and it gives a very good indication of the direction of travel of the practice direction uh, to part 57 uh, 57 generally this is the kind of issue that the courts are going to be concerned with and it's the kind of issue which if not complied with uh, can expose uh, parties to the sanctions uh, 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 referred to in the case law I took you through at the start, Cheshire, Cheshire Zoo in particular. Um, and uh, clearly, if you don't comply with the format of the statement of truth correctly, you, you haven't got a, you, you've got, you're subject to the penalties uh, that part 22 sets out. Uh, and uh, we'll come to that in a moment. So next slide, please. Uh, yes, that's right. A uh, trial witness uh, statement must be endorsed with a certificate of compliance. So not only does the witness have to sign a statement of truth, the lawyer has to sign a certificate uh, 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 endorsing that witness statement, saying that as far as the lawyer is concerned, uh, the witness statement uh, complies uh, with the requirements. Uh, the lawyer has to say, I hereby certify that uh, I am the relevant legal representative within the meaning of practice direction uh, 57 AC. Well, OK, I am satisfied that the purpose and proper content of uh, trial witness statements and proper practice in relation to their preparation, including the witness confirmation required by paragraph 41 of the practice direction, have been uh, discussed with and explained to the witness. Uh, I believe that this trial witness statement complies with practice direction 57 AC and paragraphs 18, 1 and 2 of the practice direction uh, 32, emphasis on those provisions again, and that it has been prepared in accordance with the statement of best practice in the appendix. Well, remember, again, reference to that. And you then have to give your name, position, the date it, you have to sign it. Uh, well, I hardly need to emphasize quite how serious it would be uh, for a legal representative to sign that declaration falsely uh, in circumstances uh, where, where where they don't really or can't reasonably uh, uh, justify uh, the belief in uh, uh, those um, uh, uh, th th those statements. So there's a lot of emphasis in these courts on making sure that a witness in the business and property courts understands the function of their role as witness. Um, and it's fairly clear where the emphasis lies from the word in these provisions, which is the reason I take you through these in, in some detail. 
uh, paragraph 4.4 uh, any application to dispense with the certificate of compliance in relation to paragraph three or to vary the, from the form of it thereof um, may be made, generally should be made, without notice for determination without a hearing. So you can apply to vary on an ex parte basis. Quite why you'd ever need to do that, I don't know. Um, seems to me a lot less trouble just to comply. But there we have it. Uh, next paragraph. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, why does all of this matter? Well, there are specific sanctions in the Business and Property Court distinct from those set out in the Practice for Action uh, to Part 32. Uh, the court retains its full powers of case management and the full range of sanctions available to it. So, uh, for example, those set out in, in, in um, Practice Direction 32, refusing to admit the statement or refusing to uh, admit parts of it, uh, court can strike out all or part of the statement. Uh, if a party fails to comply with any part of this practice direction, so this is an independent standalone sanction, the court may, upon act, upon application by any other party or of its own motion, do one of the, or, or more of the following, uh, refuse to give or withdraw permission to rely on or strike out part or all of the trial witness statement, order that a trial witness statement uh, be redrafted in accordance with the practice direction uh, or as it may be directed by the court, uh, make an adverse costs order against the non-complying party, order a witness to give some or all of that uh, evidence in chief orally. Uh, the court may, upon application of any other party or its own motion, strike out a trial witness statement which is not endorsed with the certificate of compliance. So it's a very broad range of sanctions that the court can impose. But do remember the case law. Uh, we're not concerned with minor or trivial breaches of the rules. We are concerned with substantial non-compliance. Um, so that's uh, a witness statement which contains material wholly unrelated uh, to that permitted by paragraph three uh, of the uh, practice direction uh, uh, to, to part 57. Uh, something that doesn't include the proper form of the statement of truth, something that doesn't um, include the certificate of compliance, a witness statement uh, prepared uh, in the wrong language or without compliance with the translation provisions, which we'll, we'll come to. Um, do note that these do that these provisions are focused on trial witness statements. So the the, the same set of restrictions don't generally apply to a witness statement supporting a, an interim application for sake of argument an application for specific disclosure or for, for summary judgment or for or for uh, relief from sanctions that, that, that those are not trial witness statements and the provisions of part of the practice direction to part 32 apply to them uh, but the provisions for the most part uh, in, in practice direction 57 ac uh, do not uh, those apply only to trial witness statements, which is to say a witness statement uh, to be used uh, at uh, trial. So next slide, please. Uh, oh, yes, and of course, uh, the uh, practice direction uh, to paragraph uh, 57 AC does appear at the appendix uh, to uh, that, uh, uh, the, 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 that, that practice direction. So Hank, next slide, please. Right, statements of truth. We're back out of the business and property courts. So we're back out of uh, trial witness statements, at least in business and property courts. And we're looking at statements of truth generally. Uh, paragraph uh, 20, uh, uh, one, uh, of 20 one of of paragraph of CPR 20, a witness statement is the equivalent of oral evidence, which the witness um, it would, if called, give in evidence, it must include a statement by the intended witness in their own language that they believe the facts are true. So it's a mandatory requirement, if you're very familiar to everyone here, that a witness statement that contain a statement of truth. Next slide, please. Uh, if in doubt, um, paragraph, uh, beg your pardon, CPR 22.1, the following documents must be verified by a statement of truth, a witness statement. Uh, 22.3, if the maker of a witness statement fails to verify uh, the witness statement by a statement of truth, 
the court may direct that it shall not be admissible in evidence. So uh, internally within the practice direction to part 32, dealing with witness statements generally, as a reminder uh, that statements of truth apply, the rule itself is in uh, part 22. The sanction for getting it wrong, uh, the maker of the witness statement may be denied permission by the court uh, to rely on that witness statement. It may be deemed inadmissible as evidence. Next slide, please. The form of the statement it is familiar, but recall that it changed in 2020. It used to be much more straightforward than this. Uh, the text in bold is what was added. Uh, I believe that the fact statement this witness statement is true, always used to be the wording. Uh, now, it's also, I understand that proceedings for contempt of court may be brought against anyone who makes or causes to be made a false statement in a document verified by a statement of truth without an honest belief in its truth. Well, fairly self-explanatory why that's there. Uh, and the, the tone adopted in those words is, um, well, telling. Um, the courts were, I, I suggest, fed up to the hind teeth with witnesses not being entirely truthful, demonstrably so, in which statements and suggesting they didn't appreciate the consequences thereof. Well, now you don't have any choice. You have to sign a document saying that you understand that proceedings for contempt of court can be brought against anyone uh, who makes or causes to be made a false wit uh, uh, statement in a document verified by a statement of truth. Uh, next slide, please. Here we go again. Uh, the statement of truth verifying a witness statement must be in the witness's own language. Um, yes, in answer to that question, uh, it, it is usually the practice for these slides to be sent uh, after the seminar, at least for those who want them. Um, and uh, I appreciate that this is quite a gallop through the material. It's the greatest will in the world. No one's going to be able to memorize this all in the in the space of a of an hour or so. Um, so, uh, the language of the witness statement. I beg your pardon. But the statement of truth verifying the witness statement must be in the witness's own language. So again, that emphasis on translation uh, of foreign language witness statements. We're coming to that just in a few moments. I do think it is the 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 most important issue at the moment. A statement of truth must be dated uh, with the date on which it's signed, self-explanatory. Uh, a statement of truth verifying a witness statement must be signed by the witness, again, self-explanatory. Um, you can have particulars of claim, for example, signed by a solicitor, provided it complies with certain provisions. Um, but no, a witness statement obviously has to be signed uh, by uh, the witness themselves. There's no way of getting out of that. Uh, next slide, please. Here we go. This is the key. These are the key provisions. The language requirements. Paragraph 23 of the practice direction to part 32. Um, 23.2. Where a witness statement is in a foreign language, the party wishing to rely on it must have it translated and file the foreign language statement with the court. And the translator must sign the original statement and must certify that the translation is accurate. So let's break it down. We know that the witness statement must be in the witness's own language. Yeah. That mandatorily in the business and property courts, their own language is a language which the witness is confident to be cross examined in. So if they're comfortable being cross examined in English, that's fine even if English isn't their first language. If they're going to be using a translator or are not going to be able to withstand cross-examination in English, uh, they, 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 they have to be treated as English not being their own language. And in that situation, the witness statement and the statement of truth must be in their own language. It must then be translated into English, not the other way around. Both the English language version and the foreign language version uh, must be uh, disclosed. It must be um, pr provided. It must be filed at court at the same time. Um, so that's by the date for which witness statements are to be uh, uh, exchanged. At B, 
the translator must sign the original statement and must certify that the translation is accurate. Uh, so I dealt with a case recently uh, where there was a false declaration uh, that the translation was accurate. The translated version of the witness statement um, from the foreign language to English omitted key provisions. There we have it. Uh, not a position I'd like to be in as a translator, but that's how it's done. Foreign language first, translation, file both, sign to certify that it's accurate. Next slide, please. For those of you who, who, who want to receive these slides when they're sent out, uh, there's a, a summary there setting out uh, the um, uh, requirements. Again, just a reminder, please do not get this wrong. It is a very, very expensive uh, mistake that no, no one wants to be responsible for. If the witness speaks, uh, if the witness doesn't speak sufficient English or Welsh in Wales, to be cross-examined in that language, the witness statement must be prepared in their own language, including the statement of truth. It must then be translated, uh, signed and dated, certificate of compliance by the translator, and both must be filed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, do take this seriously. Uh, don't try to get away with it, even when it seems pretty reasonable. The next slide. Uh, next slide, please, Hank. Uh, the next slide is the case law on this point. Um, Correa and Williams, uh, 2022 determination of the High Court. What happens here? Is, this is this is a, a a dispute relating to housing disrepair as memory serves. But but more importantly, what's happened here is that the solicitors for the claimant try to get out of the requirements in a way that superficially seems pretty reasonable. Um, they don't want to pay or the client doesn't want to pay for a translator at translating Portuguese language uh, witness statement into English or vice versa. So what the solicitor does is as follows. Uh, while I can understand uh, what the big pen does as well as he signs this, while I can understand and speak English, I'm not wholly fluent. OK, so it's not his own language, the purpose of these rules and rely on the insistence of an interpreter during court proceedings. I am able to make this statement in English because the principal solicitor at Harris de Silva solicitor speaks fluent Portuguese. My solicitor's translated it for me. The witness statement ends with a statement of truth uh, in English. Mm -hmm. OK, and a certificate of translation, which reads, I, uh, Charles de Silva, principal solicitor uh, of the Silva Solicitors, hereby certify that I'm proficient in Portuguese uh, and English. Uh, I translated the foregoing statement and read it back uh, to Mr. Correa in its entirety in Portuguese on the 15th of December 2021. The statement of truth is signed by the parent himself and the certificate of compliance by the solicitor. Uh, next slide, please. Sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it, in principle? Let's see what the court made of it. While not immediately applicable in these county court proceedings, it is of interest to note what the King's Bench Division and the Chancery Division guidance uh, uh, guides rather say on the topic of witness statements from witnesses who are not fluent in English. Uh, the King's Bench Guide 2016 provides paragraph 1061. If a witness statement is not sufficiently fluent in English to give their evidence in, in English, the witness statement should be in the witness's own language and the translation provided. Well, we, we know that's the case uh, from uh, CPR 2022 20, uh, for the statement of truth and uh, the paragraph 181 of the practice direction of part 32. Uh, the Chancery Guide. Uh, if a witness is not sufficiently fluent in English to give his or her evidence in English, the witness statement should be in the witness's own language, and translated, and so on and so forth. If the witness statement is not, if the witness is not fluent in English but can make himself or herself understood in broken English and can understand written English, the statement need not be in his or her, her own words, provided that these matters are indicated in the statement. However, it must be written so as to express as accurately as possible the substance of his or her evidence. Slide, please see where we're going with this. The appellant sought permission in accordance with CPR 25-2, as the court made clear at 30. Contrary to the judge's view, the statement uh, was not inadmissible per se, but it was inadmissible without the judge's permission. Well, we, we, we know that. That's it's actually 
paragraph 25 to the practice direction to part 32, but uh, never mind. Um, looks like the High Court didn't, didn't pick up on that nuance. Uh, the witness statement was not inadmissible per se. Well, that's right. Uh, but it was inadmissible without the judge's permission, also right. Had the judge simply refused to admit the st witness statement without considering the circumstances before him, uh, his decision would have been open to criticism. So the court has to look at the circumstances uh, surrounding uh, the uh, non-compliance with the language requirements. It's not open to a judge simply to treat them as mandatory and strike it out as of uh, uh, as night follows day, as it were. But he did not. He made it clear at paragraph 30 that if he was wrong to regard the statement as inadmissible per se, which it was, he would not be prepared in this case to allow the waiver, as it were, of these defects. And the critical question, therefore, is whether the judge was entitled to exercise his discretion to refuse uh, to admit that witness statement. This was an appeal against refusal to do so. Next paragraph, please. Next slide, please, rather. In my judgment, he was entitled to exercise his discretion in that way. In all the respects identified by the judge, this witness statement failed to meet the requirements of the rules. Uh, the rules about the provision of, e of witness statements by those who are not fluent in English provides an important discipline for litigants and their advisers, uh, hint, hint, and are not likely to be ignored. The judge correctly identified the reasons why uh, to have allowed this witness statement would have been admitted to be admitted would have been grossly unfair. In particular, the respondent had provided a witness statement in which uh, which complied with the rules and as a result uh, the appellant knew the evidence to which he had to respond uh, so uh, the, a bit late in the day to start changing it now by contrast the respondent ha only had the account of events drafted by the appellant's solicitor in a language in which the appellant was not fluent the difficulties that would have faced the respondent's counsel in cross-examination on such a witness them are obvious as the judge observed one of the purposes <coughs> of requiring service in advance of a uh, trial witness statement are to tie the witnesses down uh, to one account of events uh, uh, to have allowed in this statement would have enabled the appellant to escape this constraint. Next, next slide, please. In short, witness statement struck out appeal against that uh, uh, direction uh, not allowed, even in circumstances where superficially there was a fairly reasonable attempt to get around the requirements. Um, and those paragraphs we've read from Correa just now are more or less the uh, views taken by district judges uh, that, that it, faced with non-compliant uh, or witness statements which don't comply with the language requirements. Um, in general, uh, that's very much the way the courts are going on the, on this. Uh, it is a very easy thing to get wrong. Translators are expensive. It's a faff. You've got tight deadlines. You realize you've got 48 hours to get your witness statements in. You're anticipating doing it in English and all of a sudden you realize, oh, no, it should have been in the witness's own language. And, so, and you've got to seek an extension at best or apply for relief from sanctions at worst. Uh, think about it. With every witness statement you make for anyone who appears to speak a relatively limited uh, amount of, of English. It's not the only thing that the courts uh, are emphasizing. Uh, the uh, statement of truth uh, is, is very easy to get wrong and pretty catastrophic if you do. Um, make sure it's in the right format, make sure it's signed properly. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people do get it wrong still. Um, and in the business and property court, it does seem to be a, a, a buzz area at the moment in this, in, 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 with this kind of issue. Uh, there's a lot of focus on inappropriate content and witness statements. So make sure your witnesses aren't arguing cases. Make sure the certificate of compliance is right. Make sure the revised form of the statement of truth is right. Uh, make sure that you're setting out how each witness knows the material which that witness uh, knows or says they know. Uh, just about everything else is a matter of good practice, but so far as possible, make sure you're complying. Uh, if you don't, if you get something wrong, don't panic. Um, the courts are uh, expected not to come down uh, uh, with a hammer on 
non-compliance with something that isn't essential in character um, and I've identified during the course of this lecture areas which I think are essential in character but trying to get it right uh, just uh, uh, as a matter of good practice okay so that is a canter through the question of witness statements at um, considerable uh, at considerable pace uh, Mr Nathan I, I, I agree the witness in Korea uh, would would indeed have been in considerable trouble they may well have needed a a translator at least um and more more fundamentally the point the high court agreed that he was in trouble and so did not admit his witness statement for that reason so i'm going to hang it i'm going to hand over to hank now uh, that's it from me i'm going to be here until the end of the seminar if there's any questions please uh, do free, feel free uh, to ask yes well uh, good afternoon everyone thank you very much for, for attending today the, the, the purpose of my talk is really to go through practice direction 57 AD and the scheme governing disclosure in the business and property courts. The, the reality is that there's, as I'm sure many of you will know, a, a lot to cover in this practice direction. Um, and, and in the time I have allotted to me, it's, it's really insufficient to deal with everything. So, so what I was going to do was briefly go through the key provisions and identify the overall structure. Uh, and then I'm going to focus in particular on uh, issue identification, which I think uh, is a particularly important point. By way of introduction, the, this, the practice direction took effect from 1st of October 2022. It's, of course, very similar to the pilot, the pilot scheme which preceded it. And the main changes to note are, firstly, the less complex claims procedure has been expanded due mainly to concerns raised by practitioners about the costs involved in complying with disclosure, the disclosure regime and claims with a total value generally of between 500 and 700 K. Secondly, there's some additional guidance for drafting the issues of disclosure, which I, th I think is to be welcomed uh, as under the scheme, there are a significant number of requests for judicial gui guidance on that point in particular. Uh, thirdly, the definition of adverse documents has been clarified. And fourthly, part eight claims are now explicitly excluded. Now, the scheme applies to new proceedings issued in the, in the business and property courts, but also to existing proceedings. And it's important to note the scope of the application of the practice direction as it applies to existing proceedings or proceedings which were issued prior to 1st of October. Now the clarifications provided in paragraph 1.3, if there is a claim issued before 1st of October and an order for disclosure has already been made prior to that date, um, the order for disclosure will stand and the party won't be required to follow the procedure in the practice direction. Now for the keynotes, uh, you can opt into the procedure by applying to vary or set aside the uh, pre-existing order for disclosure. Uh, and there may well be proponents of the scheme who much prefer it, and perhaps those persons might make such an application. But I, I think in the general run of cases, it's difficult to see such applications being a common occurrence. On the other hand, if a claim is issued before 1st of October, and an order for disclosure has not been made before that date, uh, then the scheme will apply. So, so that's an important point to be aware of um, in terms of the scope of the scheme. Now, in terms of the interaction with the other rules, the pre-existing rules in, in the CPR regarding disclosure, really the core point is that section two preserves the following rules, CPR 3116, namely the power to order pre-action disclosure, CPR 3117, the power to make a non-party disclosure order. CPR 3119, uh, the public interest immunity uh, ground. CPR 3122, uh, and the rules relating to subsequent use of disclosed documents. So all of those uh, powers still apply in the context of this new scheme. Now, there has been some difficulty with respect to the residual power to order specific disclosure. 
whilst there is a similar power contained in paragraph 18.1, that power only applies in the context of a claim where extended disclosure has been ordered. So there's something of a lacuna in cases where extended disclosure hasn't been ordered or requested by the parties. The consensus really seems to be uh, that in those cases, the court can make an order for specific disclosure, uh, albeit under its general case management powers in CPR part three. Now, I've got one eye slightly on the time, so I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the duties. Uh, the, the three core points to know, I think, uh, firstly, paragraph 3.16 makes clear that there is a duty on the parties to use reasonable efforts to avoid providing documents to another party that have no relevance to the issues for disclosure in the proceedings. And, and I think that duty really reflects one of the chief overarching purposes of the scheme, namely to avoid parties doing big disclosure dumps of documents with questionable relevance um, and running up unnecessarily at large legal bills. Secondly, that there is a duty to ensure disclosure is conducted cost effectively. And importantly, that includes the use of technology. Now, for, for, for those of our listeners who aren't particularly uh, keen technologists, that might be a problem. If a legal representative fails to accede to or otherwise resist the use of technology, and this contributes to uh, an increase in costs overall, there will arguably be a breach of that duty, and that breach can be expected, I think, to sound in cost consequences. So, so really what the courts are doing here is giving everyone in the legal profession or everyone involved in uh, business and property court type claims a gentle nudge to adopt and deploy uh, useful technologies that streamline the disclosure process. The, the third point to note is that the new disclosure scheme quite properly takes very seriously the issue of document preservation. And, and section four is, is dedicated entirely to this issue. In, in practice, what this means for legal representatives, at least, um, relevant notifications will need to be sent to the parties and their employees who may have useful documentation to preserve those documents. And if, if important documents are destroyed or misplaced, even inadvertently, that can be expected to sound in, in very serious consequences, both in terms of uh, the substantive liability and also costs. So the first stage of the process is the initial disclosure process stage. Put shortly, when a pleading is filed, a party is under an obligation to provide an initial dis uh, disclosure of list of documents um, that is accompanied by the key documents on which it, the party has relied expressly or otherwise in support of the claim or defense and the key documents necessary to understand the claim or defense they have to meet. Now, importantly, the obligation at the initial disclosure stage does not involve disclosure of known adverse documents. And, and there is also no obligation at that juncture to undertake a search beyond any search that was required uh, in order to draft the pleadings or obtain pre-action advice. So exa examples, of documents which may fall within the scope of initial disclosure are contracts or evidences to a specific representation that's been made in cases where misrepresentation is alleged. Those really are the kind of classic documents that might fall within uh, the initial disclosure obligations. Now, an interesting decision on this is uh, the case of Brittenbach. And in that case, the claimant sought disclosure and inspection of certain documents, which the defendant was currently aware of. Um, the underlying claim in that case concerned advice given in relation to various film finance schemes. And, and the defendant's defense was uh, that it was appropriately advised on the schemes and it was not required to give uh, the specific advice which the claimants say they should have been provided with. Now the claimant sought disclosure of two classes of documents under the at the initial disclosure phase. 
First, generic or standard form documents that related to oral advice generally provided. And second, documents relating to the centralized due diligence processes referred to in the defense. The leg relied on by the claimants was that these were documents that were necessary in order to assist them in order to, to understand the defense. Now, the court rejected that. The court held that, yes, the documents were necessary in order to evaluate the prospects of success of the defense, but they were not necessary in order to understand the substantive nature of the defense being alleged. Moreover, the pleading itself did not expressly or impliedly identify those documents. And I think really there are two key takeaways from that decision. For firstly, it's not enough that documents are necessary to, to weigh up the prospects of success of the pleading. They have to be necessary to understand the claim or defense. Secondly, if a document is not referred to in the pleading, um, it will of course be very difficult to specifically identify a, a document which is impliedly referred to. So for, for those struggling with initial disclosure, the, the decision in Brettenbach is a, a useful signpost in, in all of these respects as to the proper scope of the initial disclosure process. Now, paragraph 5.3 sets out the circumstances in which initial disclosure won't be required. I won't go into any more detail on that now. The next phase is, in some cases, at least extended disclosure. The parties are expected to request extended disclosure if they want it. Now, this really is where the, the scheme comes into its own, because at this phase, the shape which disclosure can take is highly customizable. And, and what that means is it's very important for parties to be conscious of the rules and which of the possible tailored options will best serve its client given the circumstances of a specific case. Now, extended disclosure can incorporate any combination of models in respect of individual issues of disclosure. And the models, there are five models, model A, model B, model C, model D, model E. Model A is the most basic model. It's, it's limited to known adverse documents. And known adverse documents means a document a party is actually aware of uh, without undertaking a specific search and which contain information that contradicts or materially damages the disclosing party's contention or version of events or supports the contention or version of events of an opposing party on an issue in dispute. Now, this model is the most limited model. It's most likely suitable in cases where, for example, the, the heart of the dispute is a simple issue of contractual uh, con construction. Model B is, is wider, and it's wider because it includes, without limit as to quantity, the, the documents which would fall within the initial disclosure. Now, initial disclosure is limited by quantity, uh, and so in this respect, Model B expands the obligation. There's an option for search, and if the parties undertake a search, then the continuing duty under CPR 3.12 applies. I'm going to go slightly over time, um, but so if those of you who need to leave at, at one o'clock, please feel free to leave, of course. Um, I, I won't run over too much. I'm going to skirt over model C, D and E. Uh, the point is that model C is really regarded as the preferred model for extended disclosure. It permits requests for uh, documents to be made uh, or narrow classes of documents and, and will generally require use of a disclosure review document. We also see scope for court oversight as to the specific nature of the requested document. And we see this at paragraph two. Model D is narrow search-based disclosure with or without narrative documents. And narrative documents are defined by paragraph 1.11 of appendix one. Model E is the most expensive model it's wide search-based disclosure and what's commonly referred to as train of inquiry disclosure. Now, 
Model E is really geared towards claims in which there are allegations of dishonesty or underhand dealings. Uh, and it's a model which should only be used in exceptional circumstances. And I think the court can be expected to police its usage very closely indeed. Now, I've been referring to the disclosure review document, and as many of you will know, this is a very important document in the context of search based disclosure. The relevant timeline, so far as the preparation of this document is concerned, is also very important for parties to keep in mind. The, the first step is within 28 days of uh, the final statement of case being closed, the claimant must state in writing whether a request for search-based disclosure to include models C, D or E is likely. Step two, 42 days from the final statement, uh, from the date the final statement of case is filed and served, um, there has to be a draft list of issues for disclosure, and this is included in section 1A of the disclosure review document. In respect of each issue for disclosure, the claimant must indicate which model it proposes. If the claimant is proposing model C, they should indicate how the particular documents or narrow issues of class of documents it proposes should be defined. No list of issues are required if the models are confined to models A and B. Now the party served of that list is 21 days from service to indicate using section 1A, uh, or if applicable at uh, section 1b of the disclosure review document as to whether it agrees with the proposal regarding model usage if it does not alternative proposals should be set out and the list should show areas of disagreement uh, and those issues may if necessary be determined uh, via disclosure guidance from the court now i'm going to quickly really the, the remaining steps are fairly self-explanatory. Um, the big question underlying all of this is issue identification. And issue identification is a very, very important part of this process. And it has proved to be a fertile ground for dispute between parties. The starting point is the definition given for issues for disclosure in the practice direction. Issues of dis for disclosure mean only those key issues in dispute which the parties consider will need to be determined by the court with reference to contemporaneous documents in order for there to be a fair resolution of the proceedings. Importantly, it does not extend to every issue which is disputed in the statements of case by denial or non-admission. There is an obligation on the claimant to seek to ensure that the draft list of issues for disclosure provides a fair and balanced summary of the key areas of dispute identified by the party statements of case and in respect of which it is likely that one or other of the parties will be seeking extended disclosure. Now I've set out three cases, all of which are available on, on Bailey, um, which provide very, very helpful guidance as to how this point should be approached. In McParland, the parties requested a disclosure guidance hearing the underlying claim concerned an alleged breach of a non-complete and confidentiality clause uh, in a service agreement. In essence, the defendant defied, denied the enforceability of, of those clauses and the parties had agreed 16 issues for disclosure and had also agreed the appropriate models for some but not all of those issues. Now, the court said the starting point in the identification process should be driven by consideration of the documentation that is or is likely to be in each party's possession. And the judge gave an example of how the parties went wrong. One of the issues for disclosure identified, and which was agreed, was the date on which the defendant's employment was terminated. Now, the judge considered that actually this really was more of a legal issue, and it was not an issue to which any documents beyond those uh, which were already provided, i.e. contractual documentation, would be relevant. The issue was principally a matter of construction of the relevant contracts, uh, and therefore, whilst obviously the, the, the issue would be an issue for trial, uh, there was no reason for it to appear in the list of issues for disclosure. 
Now, there's an important difference between issues for disclosure and issues for trial. Issues for disclosure are issues to which undisclosed documentation in the hands of one or more of the parties is likely to be relevant and important for the fair resolution of the claim. Now, there is one outstanding issue in some of these cases about whether one of the issues for disclosure must also be uh, an issue which has crystallized in the statements of case as they currently stand. The consensus seems to be that the approach suggested in McParland is correct uh, and that an issue which is not pleaded cannot generally be an issue for disclosure. And I think parties will want to bear that in mind when approaching their pleadings. I think re really when the, the bottom line is when approaching and preparing when pre preparing issues for disclosure, the parties have to bear in mind the primary function of this process. And the primary function is firstly, to help the parties consider whether extended disclosure is required, and if so, which models or model, uh, models should be used. Secondly, uh, identifying documents and categories of documents that, that are likely to exist and which are required to be disclosed. Uh, and, and finally, to avoid the production of documents that are not relevant to the issues in the proceedings. Uh, and I would, urge, I would urge all of our listeners to go through and read those cases with the paragraph references. Um, uh, it provides very helpful guidance indeed as to how this particular aspect of the scheme should be approached. Um, I'm out of time, but the, the final point I really wanted to discuss was the less complex claims procedure. Um, an important change in the new scheme is that this procedure has been expanded. Um, and so now it applies for claims up and under one million pounds in value. Uh, but of course, value alone is not determinative. There may, there may well be a, a claim worth 500,000 uh, where the complexity of the issues do require um, a, a different approach. Under this procedure, the key points are models C and E aren't available. So the parties are limited to models A, B or D. Uh, the availability of model D is important. Secondly, there's no requirement to use or, or complete a disclosure review document if the models uh, proposed are limited to models A and or B. And again, that provides a useful opt-out uh, provision, as it were, for, for parties who are trying to minimize costs where the issues are fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, that's it from me. I uh, appreciate I've gone through that at quite some speed. The, just looking at the see if we've had any questions. Uh, so there's one question in relation to ELPL claims. Um, there's no other questions, but the our emails should, I believe, be on the... Yes, here they are. If anyone had any questions at all uh, about anything that's been discussed, we would be more than happy to um, respond uh, via email. Uh, in answer to the question in relation to um, drafting witness statements for, the EL, for ELPL claims, essentially the same rules apply. Uh, it's, you, you, you won't have anything, uh, you won't be in the business and property courts uh, for that kind of material. Um, it, you, you'd be looking at the practice direction department 32 and, and, and CPR 22 uh, for the statement of truth. Um, but nothing distinctive about claims in that area. Uh, just about the only area I can think of there being some additional controversy is it would, complexity rather would be the bankruptcy courts. Um, they have their own rules under the insolvency rules beyond the scope of this presentation. But for the your ordinary um, personal injury ELPL RTA protocol claims, um, ordinary witness statement rules apply. All right. Um, well, thank you very much for attending, everyone. Um, that's it from us again. If there are any questions at all, um, please do feel free to email.